So we will. Please, the floor is yours, Henrike first and Isabel then. Good afternoon, everybody. Our dedicated the European Spa online lecture series audience, and specifically today, our guest Isabel Foskotter Behrens from University of Paderborn. We are delighted that you are with us. Isabel Foskotter Behrens will present her research today on fashion in fashionable spa towns, the German spas, Bad Homburg, Bad Nauheim, and Wiesbaden as fashion venues. And if I understand that right, Isabel, this is part of your PhD research. Is that right? Yes, it is. Mm. So we're really, really happy to have you here. And I remember that you um, met with team members at the SPA conference in Bad Nendorf. Was, in Bad Nendorf. Nendorf. Yeah, yeah. So that's really always good to see how our small or growing and big audience um um keeps keeps evolving with regard to all these other conferences and and meetings and really continuing a network so isabel foscotter thank you very much for being with us uh, in this afternoon and the floor is yours we are all looking forward to a fashionable lecture thank you very much i tried to share my presentation with you can you see that Yes, we do. Fine, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear online listeners, I would like to begin my presentation by thanking Astrid Kohler for the invitation and Henrike Schmidt for her kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be able to present and discuss with you today some aspects of my PhD thesis on occasion-related woman clothing and fashion spars Bad Homburg for der Höhe, Bad Nauheim and Wiesbaden in the 1910s which is being written in Germany at the Department of Cultural Studies of Fashion and Textile under Professor Dr. Kerstin Kraft at the University of Paderborn. My work is also supervised by Professor Dr. Birgit Hase of the Department of Design at the University of Applied Science in Hamburg. Since February, my dissertation has been funded by Hess Scholarship. My objects of invitation, as you can see it here on the contemporary maps, the spa, towns in, uh, the spa towns in central Germany. Um, in geographical proximity around Frankfurt on the Main. In the spa of the 20th century, unlike today, the focus was not on medical recovery, but was a social event that enabled guests to exchange in social exchange, relaxation and pleasure. This so-called social cure saw itself as a space for leisure and innovation, which is often described in the research literature with the term modebad, translated fashionable bars or spas, without even explaining what it actually means. When I speak of modebad, I do so in the sense of Johannes Arthur Shelvin's definition. In an essay published in 1912, he discussed the connections between economy and fashion. From his economic perspective, and define, he defined the term modebad, which I have translated into English for you here as follows. Thus one also speaks of modebada, whereby both the elegant world, which is in the fortunate position of being able to display the very latest creations of famous Italian geniuses, and the fact that one is particularly convinced of feeling power of the bath in question at the moment, um, contribute to the reputation as a fashionable bar. The term modebad used by Shelvin is thus paradigmatic of a broadly defined term fashion. While the first part of the quote focuses on material or textile objects in form of clothing, the second part points out that fashion includes not only objects, but also specific places, vestimentary infrastructure and the practices associated with them. According to sociologist Andreas Reckwitz, things or artifacts cannot be reduced to objects of representation, but are themselves necessary components of social practices. He continues, undoubtedly, these things are interpreted and sensuously occupied by human actors in certain ways, 
but at the same time they are applied, used and must be handled in their materiality. More strongly, they contain a momentum of their own and perform what social practices and networks are possible in and with them. If I transfer this statement to closing in the spa context, it means that the object of closing does not take a passive role in its handling and use, but actively helps to shape the spa culture. And I would like to show you with a few examples how strongly closing was integrated into the everyday life of the spa guests. So what will I talk about in the next 45 minutes? This lecture, like my dissertation, will explore the question of the extent to which mode beda and dress practice shape each other. So I will first look at the preparations and the journey to the spa towns, then merge the daily routine with the rooms of the spa district and highlight dress practice using the example of the fountain dress, the tennis dress and the evening dress. According to the notice of the newspaper Das Illustrierte Blatt of July 1914, for an elegant mode of art, the wardrobe must be a suitable elegant one, so as not to attract unwelcome attention. What is already implicit here is that clothing had to be adapted to the spa. Thus, spa guests had to consider in advance what clothing they would need during their stay at the spa. When the main travel season started every year in spring, the spa Bar public grew concerned at the same time, what do I wear? Which toilets do I pack in order to always be provided for and yet not to use too much luggage? The newspaper article mentioned earlier reported in detail what should be packed for a spa. A travel coat and Macintosh, a jacket dress with two or three blouses underneath of flannel or similar fabric of, for cool days, a better light dress, or a better choice, a jacket costume meant as an ensemble of jacket and skirt. The luggage also had to be supplemented by a light, simple lining costume for the morning, an elegant jacket dress for the afternoon and a dress that could be combined with a cape. This statement suggests that spa guests travel to the spas with a choice of clothes. And packing, commented the Berlin fashion magazine, Elegante Welt, is an art that very few travelers master. If a garment has been packed properly, it should arrive at its destination exactly as uncrushed as it was placed in the suitcase before departure. Handles could be sh um, shown at the tailors, or you could buy a suitcase that, met pack that make packing easier. The suitcase industry developed a wide variety of suitcase types, as you can see here. Not only the clothing and spa towns, but also already on the journey had to be considered. Recommendations were offered by the so-called etiquette books. These were guides to the valid norms of behavior and rules of etiquette, of which you are certainly still familiar with Knigge today. The role of appearance also emphasizes by Egon Noska in the 1912 Guten Ton, on the journey, we are judged by our clothes and we cannot well demand to be regarded as respectable people if we are going along poor and unclean, especially as the dust and strain of the journey already take something out of our clothes. Henriette Schramm summed up travel clothing in a simple formula, practical, comfortable and pretty. In the 19th century, the construction of the society house, later known as Kurhaus, in the spa towns had triggered a great deal of building activity, which still characterizes the townscape today. As the Ferris plans show, all three spa towns had a prototypical appearance in the early 20th century, which I would like to show here using the example of Bad Homburg. The central building of the spa district were the Kurhaus, Bathhaus, drinking fountains with uh, drinking halls and pump rooms, churches of various denominations, and sport grounds. These spaces were connected by gardens and parks and could be reached by a promenade and walking path. The fact that these spaces were also sought of and used as fashion and presentation spaces is evidenced by contemporary terms, such as fountain elegance for the morning stop at the drinking fountain, or blasphemy avenue as a colloquial term for the promenade. In addition to the bar district, the Modebäder also include 
the closing infrastructure of the spa towns. As can be seen here from the trade directory of Homburg's address book, 1910 and 11 edition, the shops for cleaning and fashionable goods and milliners had predominantly settled in Luisenstraße. The geographical arrangement around the Kurhaus can be seen on the first map, so that all the above mentioned shops were within walking distance of spa guests. Not only did this make the Kurhaus the center of the town, it also suggests that the spa guests were regarded as potential customers of the local shops. This line of argument can be extended from the topographical location of the shop to the advertisements and the finished dress. For example, the advertisements of the Frankfurt fashion shop Wagner and Schlödel, which was published in the spa lists of Homburg, provide information not only about the location of the shop, but also about the range of goods which were offered. Here different coats, dresses, and blouses for women. And it's now up to me to reconstruct what kind of garments are meant here and for what the occasions they were suitable. From the event programs to stay with the Bad Homburg example, it is evident that the daily routine in the spa towns was constructed by regular events and can be assigned to the respective rooms. In all the spa towns, spa concerts were held three times a day. Twice a week, there were evening re reunions in the Kurhaus. There was a large repertoire of events in all the spa towns with parallel events and those taking place several times a day, offering spa guests a wide choice and variation. Spa treatments or meals were not specifically listed in these programs. It seems as if two parallel daily schedules existed with the medical and the pleasure program, which were roughly coordinated with each other, but at the same time also allowed some leeway for the organization of the day. How important the sequence of the events was for the choice of the clothes is shown by a double spread of the subject, the five dresses of the lady. Using the protagonist Madeleine as an example, the sketch fans out a woman repertoire of clothing in the course of a day. After getting up, Madeleine put on a pale blue kimono over her nightgown. For the morning walk in the park, she put on a cassage coat with a long skirt. In the afternoon, a tea dress with a gathered skirt, and in the evening, a white crab dress. For the theater, she completed this, this dress with a red coat and a cap with fantasy feathers. As this example shows, women had to change their clothes depending on time of day and the occasion. Thus, several times a day and up to eight times was common. In spa towns, the day started at the drinking fountain. And this brings me to my first of the three examples. The fountain dress was described by the elegant world. Thus, what have previously been an unloved, boring fountain coat, which was brought into being for those women who had no desire or time to make complicated toilets and who resorted to a cover for the lack of delicacy in their suit thrown on the hidden haste, had evolved into the present fountain dress, which had to fulfill two aspects. On the one hand, it demands simplicity suited to the early hour and eliminates precious fabrics such as silk. And on the other hand, it demands a sparkling originality for when one meets at such an extraordinary time, one actually always expects something extraordinary. We remember back the listing of what to pack for a spa town. There, a light colored dress or jacket costume was explicitly mentioned as an item for clothing for the morning. Even though it was not declared, there as a fountain dress, it suggests that it might have been one. While fashion magazines convey the prevailing fashions and thus the social ideal it is possible to verify was actually worn in spas by comparing and contrasting it with photographs and postcards. And some of them, and this is a stroke of luck what we have here and I'll show you, can be dated to the day like the snapshot at the Elisabethenbrunn in Bad Homburg from the 27th August 
The analysis of the snapshots confirms this finding that the dress at the fountain was very variable. It even allows for a more differentiated view of dress behavior. The choice of clothing was not only based on personal taste, but also on gender, weather, weather conditions, and age. In cold weather, the women wore coats or jackets, which they did not in hot weather. For a stay of several weeks, which included a daily meeting at the spa fountain, a single dress was not, was not sufficient. Several dresses or variable garments suitable for the drinking cure had to be packed. Especially suitable for this purpose were garments such as blouses and skirts, which could be varied or newly arranged with little effort. So you can see here a woman uh, from, from early August and then from late August on two different pictures. In accordance with the drinking cure, the medically prescribed number of glasses of water were drunk in the morning before breakfast and then a walk along with the promenade was taken. Although the idea was that there was a separate dress for these both places, these spaces were so fluid that purely for practical reasons, it can be assumed that the dress worn in the, at the fountain in the morning was also worn on the promenade at the same time. This conclusion with the art historian Bokop Blester draws for the 18th century can also be applied to my period of investigation. In Bad Nauheim's tourist guide from 1912, there was a request for women. Due to complain from suffering spa guests, the Honored ladies are politely requested not to have their clothes dragged in the spa facilities in dry weather, as dust is not conductive to health and cleanliness. This sentence, which can already be found in the 1905 uh, spa guide, can be read as a remnant of the discussion about dress with trains that had been conducted in letters to the editor since the late 19th century in the newspapers. A solution to the dust swirling was named into a letter to the editor, which in 1903 anonymously appealed the Wiesbaden spa management to water the area at the Kochbrunnen in the morning. Those sick people, he wrote, who visit the fountain in the morning are mostly throating patients, so they want to breathe air that is as pure, as dust-free as possible. For this, quite efficient sprinkling is necessary, not only because of dust, but also because of the unintelligent ladies who stir up the dust with their trains and thereby damage their health more than all the doctors and wells can make up for. On the one hand, the dust would be bound on the earth by the wetness, and at the same time, this would have a side effect on closing behavior. A properly sprinkled square would put a stop to the senseless dragging of clothes in so far as the ladies in question would perhaps come to their senses through the damage caused to their clothes by the dirt and wetness, and could learn from this to be the little more considerate towards their sick neighbors and not to indulge an unslightly harmful fashion. Watering itself already was an important hygienic measure against dust in cities, especially the spa towns. So-called sprinkler trucks watered certain streets every morning. And I now give you my second example. Spa towns had an important role in the establishment of spread of sports. Derived from the English to the sport, which translated um, like to, uh, to pass the time, sport has established itself in England in the 18th century and was imported from there through the spa towns into the German Empire. In 1876, English spa gets through the lines of the tennis court on the lawn in the spa gardens at Homburg and set up their playing, playing set. A photograph to the so-called lawn tennis has been preserved in Bad Homburg's municipal archives and is considered to be the oldest tennis photograph in the world. The spread of Walter Clopton Wingfield's portable tennis set co coincided with the end of the casino era. When casinos were forced to close by the gambling ban in 1833, spa towns sought to expand the entertainment programs. In the late 19th century, therefore, one can speak of a sportification of the spa. As brochures and spa guides attest, the range of sport was very wide. Horse riding, clay picton shooting, golf, football, fencing, 
swimming, croquet, tennis, and in winter ice rinks for skating, etc., to name just a few. The fact that the spa towns adapted to the needs and wishes of the spa guests is proven by the numerous conversions and new building which can be traced on maps. But Nauheim spa facilities, as you can see here on the first plan from 1913, we were demolished in the early 20th century and rebuilt as an Art Nouveau complex between 1905 and 1910. In the course of the redesign, the tennis courts were built on October 1999 to May 1910, according to the plans of the architects Wilhelm Joost and Henry Pietri. As the ground plan shows, the tennis building also contains a cafe with two halls, an elongated hall and seating on the multi-level terrace. An inventory list documenting the furnishing of the spa building together with all the objects belong to the spa administration has been preserved in the Darmstadt State Archive. It makes it possible to embark on a vestimentary research for traces in spa buildings which I would like to show you briefly here using the Western Tennis Building as an example. Listed in the room of the long tennis warden, here marked in color, are a uniform skirt, trousers, waistcoat cap, and the equipment for the ball boys, consisting of caps, trousers, and jackets for them. You can see what a ball boy looked like in an enlarged section of a photograph here. The court number to which he was assigned was written on his armband. The tennis building has also locker rooms, which I have color coded for you. They are listed in the four plans as ladies dress and men's dresses. The inventory list provides a completely identical furnishing of the two dressing rooms, consisting of a table, six chairs, two coat rails, a mirror with frame, three food tools, a water bottle with two glasses and a tray, a further 10 chair with bags, 21, Dress coat hooks, jaw runners in various sizes, six ten tension curtains, uh, 26 lockable cupboard and an oval table. Neither the furnishing nor the arrangement are recorded in the floor plan. As the inventory list of the Kurhaus auto attest, six pictures of the lawn tennis tournament 19, 1913 hung on the glass and frame in the anteroom of the tennis building. A series of photographs has been preserved in the Hessian Stag Archive in Darmstadt, which show a tournament in August 1913 by the handwritten note on the back. The suspicion that these pictures must have been the one mentioned is strengthened by the fact that they were unusually preserved in the past part two. A tennis tournament is shown from several perspectives, whereby you can see the tennis bullet mentioned earlier in the background of the picture. Such tennis tournaments as evidenced by flyers and also brochures, were regularly held in spa towns. This tournament had famous spectators, some, such as Grand Duke Ernest Ludwig von Hessen by Rhein and his wife Eleonore, Princess von Solms Hohensolmslich, sitting behind the sidelines in the lower center of the picture. The visit of these personalities could also be used as an argument for hanging up these photographs in a clearly visible place for all spa guests. I would like to single out a female tennis player who can be seen in several photographs and thus from different perspectives and can be very easily identified by her headgear consisting of a cap with a tassel. She's wearing a necklace, loose blouse with half length sleeves. There is a hint of a collar on the back. The smooth ankle length skirt marks a higher set waist. The ensemble is completed with white loafers with a light bow and white stockings. As she pauses on the sideline, she has pulled on a long sleeve jacket or jumper and placed the tennis racket on her lap. Her sitting position reveals the cut of the skirt, which had only been hinted at the standing position. Two box pleats are worked into the front and back of the skirt, reaching just below the knee or the bend in the knee. Only the rear perspective in which the tennis player is standing on the court with her legs straddled show how much freedom of movement and leg room these pleats allow. The clothing worn by the player corresponds to the description in the contemporary etiquette book, The Golden Anstand by Els. For lawn tennis and similar games, a plain skirt with blouse is best suited. The costume should be comfortable so that it does not hinder in running and catching. 
sleeves, not too tight, but not too loose either. Skirt, footless. Instead of a corset, a light fish bodice. And shoes, a lighter leather of canvas with a broad flat heel. The SPA administration had already stipulated since the late 19th century, as it says here in the Städtische Kurdirektion in Wiesbaden, that playing was only permitted in a suitable playing costume. All indications point out to the fact that there was not yet any dedicated tennis clothing, but rather clothing that was considered suitable for tennis. Because on the one hand, it enables the movements of the player, and on the other hand, also conformed to social norms. The Elegant World complained in a June 1930 article that no garment had been or was being sinned against as much as the tennis dress. While some women found discarded dresses still quite good for tennis, only one fashion conscious lady would have an extra sport dress in her wardrobe, which was naturally white for tennis. This characteristic white indicates the wearer's leading role in society, materially and ideally. However, white clothing also had a practical use. It was known that white clothing did not heat up or fade as much. Prezas on plea, and this cannot be determined perfectly from this black and white photographs. The tennis player in this photograph here is wearing white tennis clothes. The footless skirt allows a glimpse of the shoes, which the elegante Welt described as the most important factor. The word undoubtedly was to have to be white. The fashion magazine went on to say, and the rubber sole was also essential in the interest of the well-groomed court and Madame's sensitive little feet, which are used to incredibly high stiletto heels. This already hints of what is confirmed in the regulations of the spa administration. The shoe with a white, with a white flat heel, here not, uh, were not or not only chosen because of the freedom of movement, but it had already been regulated since the 19th century that the playgrounds could only enter with lawn tennis shoes. Shoes with heels, which women wore in everyday life, were forbidden on the sport field because they damaged the grass. If one brings the above mentioned information together with the equipment of the changing room, it cannot be determined beyond doubt whether the female spa guest changed on side or already went to the changing room in tennis dress. However, it is most likely that the players mixed up their shoes, used the shoe racks to store their high heel shoes, and used the foot benches to change and help them get dressed or undressed. So I come to the third and my final example, the evening dress. In order to gain access to the spa and park facilities, which includes Kukur House, the spa tax had to be paid. In Wiesbaden, it was collected after five days at the latest. The so-called full cards entitled the holder to use the Koch fountain, as well as the Kurhaus, while the partial cards allowed entry to either the fountain or the Kurhaus. At the same time, and you can see it here on the slide, these tickets included the use of the clock room. It was specifically mentioned that for the Kurhaus, the clock room was included in the price. The floor plan of the Wiesbaden Kurhaus from 97 shows, and I've marked as blue for you, the clock rooms in the north and the south of the western vestibule. Uh, or you can say directly to the right and left of the main entrance. As early as 1881, the subscription conditions for visiting the spa house stated that losses of clothing would then be paid by the spa administration if these items of clothing were handed at the main portal or at the entrance of the conversation room against the coin. Spa guests thus had the opportunity to get rid of their jackets, coats, capes, etc., in order to be able to move around indoors without closing, outer closing. However, this regulation also proves that closing items were lost in the clock rooms. How this could happen was explained, for example, at the Cour Deputation meeting in 1916. Under the item obligation to pay compensation for lost clock room items, it said, the investigation carried out have shown that on 10 September this year, through the fault of the clock room attendant, Carlet, 
who temporarily left the cloakroom and trusted to her service, a paletot with cigar bag and gloves and a lady's coat went missing. The injured parties claim damages in the amount of together 157 mark. Since the wardrobe woman was liable for the losses, but could not raise the sum, she asked the spa administration to cover the costs. The programs, such as this from September 1912, show how often and for what events the courthouse was visited by spa guests at different times of day and on different occasions. They used the conversation and readily rooms during the day. Oh, sorry, they used the conversation and reading rooms during the day, met on the spa house terrace or in the evening in the theater or dance hall. At the request of the public, according to the spa administration, the reunion was reintroduced in the Peace Partner program at the end of 1912. The advertisement for the event contained all the important information. On Saturday, the 7th September 1912, a reunion was take, to take place at nine o'clock in the evening in the small hall of the Wiesbaden Kurhaus. According to the announcement, ladies were to appear in ball gowns and gentlemen in tailcoats. The effect this advertisement may have had on spa guests is shown by a fictitious conversation that introduced the announcement in the Wiesbadener Tagblatt. The sweet girl cheered loudly when her eyes fell on the announcement on the reunion at the courthouse. We must go there, she declared categorically to the blonde haired youth at her side who eagerly agreed. She remembered that her best dress, the blue one with the white spots had been badly damaged by rain the other day. Pa, that could be made up to look like a ball again by putting a few bows on it. What was the point of learning anything? The longer the two studied the announcement, the more confused they became. What nonsense did they say? A ball, ballroom, uniform, tailcoat, then dizzy numbers, and finally something about registration and invitation. In the end, the young couple decided against attending the event, saying a reunion is the same everywhere. You just dance. Um, yes, it's maybe right, but it's also an allied ball with exclusive character at which there was a fixed dance routine. The Wiesbadener Tagblatt praised the event in its summary. The strict impl implementation of the uniform, tailcoat and ball toilet compulsory ensured from the outset of the creation of an image that immediately conjured up the pleasant illusion that one was not at a public hall, but in the intimate hall of a private person. What is clear in this quote is the idea that clothing contributed to the overall image of the event and created atmosphere. Belonging to this elite group was demonstrated and emphasizes through occasion related dress and the corresponding behavior, of course. In October, the addition of no hat was added to the ladies dress code. And despite the efforts to specify the dress code and enforce it at the entrance to the hall, things must have gone wrong at the reunion in the early October, so that the Wiesbadener Tagblatt criticized in retrospect. It is difficult to get the audience used to the rules, and if they are not strictly observed, the fine festive tone to which the whole thing is tuned is soon gone. Thus, Next to delightful ball gowns, next to expensive toilet, one saw high colored street dresses, quite elegant indeed. There were also less elegant ones among them and which were quite pretty in themselves, but contrary to the regulations. What a pity if this is not controlled. As can be seen here from the statement, there was a discrepancy between the dress norms and actual dress practice. Since there was a hardly any pictorial sources documenting even ingress in the Wiesbaden Kurhaus, recourse to preserved objects can provide important insights. In the Horex Museum of the Goss House in Bad Homburg, there is a blue dress. As it is a poor case, the provenance cannot be proven, and consequently, it cannot be proven whether it was worn during its spa stay. It is in a state in need of restoration, which is why it cannot currently be put on a figurine and must therefore be presented to you lying down. 
According to the description of the new museum, museum database, it is a formal dress made of brocade and chiffon from around 1910. The fabric of the shoulders and sleeves is tall, a net like fabric. The sleeve hem ends at the elbow with side bows. At the shoulders, the towel has been lined with a skin colored fabric. A cross drape marks a raised waistline and combined with a set and sleeves creates a square neckline. And this corresponds to the description of a waistline in the Wiesbadener Badeblatt under the title Toilets for the Kurhaus Reunion. The waists are very low cut in the front as well as the back. In many cases, they are made sleeveless and in order to increase the impression of being unclosed, they are often worked on flesh colored silk or chiffon linings over which the fabric of the base material is laid in a scanty manner. While the waistline is completely blurred by fabric, sheeting or garnishing. This skin colored fabric is a tangible indication of how moral concepts about closing are played out on the body. <clears throat> the fact that they had not that they had to demonstrate their respectability and virtues through their behavior and dress can be reconstructed today from the etiquette books. Because there was a disagreement about the death of the decollete, Els mentioned, as a rule, as a rule, cut out toilets are prescribed for balls. There is no limit here, upwards or downwards. A cutout dress that is still so high that only the collar seems to be missing is unattractive. But a decollete that is too wide can also be highly distasteful. Here, every lady must know how to find out what is right. Below the waist of the blue dress, a straight falling floor length skirt has been added. The different fabrics are at the same shades of blue, giving the dress the appearance of being made of one piece. An eye catcher and splash of color on the back of the dress foil is provided by a bouquet of official cherries. This bouquet, which was positioned on a semicircle on the center back, conceals the fastening of the dress. It was closed by a total of six hooks and eyes at, at, at the back, and then draped over by means of inside press studs. This observation, which can only be made on the object itself, leads to the conclusion that the wearer most likely needed help in putting it on, or especially in fastening the dress. Beginning at the center back, the fabric ends in a draped train. It is attached with streets that can be seen at the bottom of the hem of the skirt before ending in a bow. You can see it here on the, on the topic of the picture. Mm -hmm. This held the terrain in place, which, as the name suggests, was dragged behind. This is also evidenced by the traces on the underside. The fact that wearing a train was a challenge is proven by the constructions in the etiquette books, some of which breach like instruction manuals. When walking, place the feet a little further apart. Avoid the heels, which are not allowed to touch each other anyway. In addition, she should take care that the forward stepping foot does not touch down with the rear heels first, but that it touches down with the lower heel and the toe almost at the same time. She must stride out with the two turned outwards and stretch downwards with a decided S accent, as if she were willing to push the dress in front of her every step. Something similar applied to turning around. In order for a woman wearing a train dress who was turning on the spot not to step on a dress, she had to increase her turning circle. This meant that she had to walk a semicircle to the right or to the left and then position the, track, uh, the train back with a foot or leg movement. Numerous contemporary films prove the correct handling and throwing back of the train. It can therefore be said that one, on the one hand, the train restricted the movement of turning, and at the same time with the positioning of the train, it required and thus demanded a leg movement. In 1903, a scientific study had confirmed the fear that particles contained in the dust of the dress trains could make people ill. The Wiesbadener Tagblatt referred to the results 
of the article, Bakterien im Staube der Kleiderschleppen, which uh, translated bacteria in the dust of the jazz trains from the Illustrated Zeitung, wherein the dust found on the trains picked up partly in the ballroom and partly in the streets was subjected to microscopic examination and the dangers caused by the bacteria stirred up or carried onto the home were pointed out. The article argued that street dust contained contagious, contagious diseases that were spread via closing train. The total of seven photographs that illustrated the original article showed train dust at natural 100 and 400 magnification. The term of a pin-sized amount of the dust which had been prepared for cultivated in nutrient gelatin, multiplied so much within a few days that they were visible in the naked eye. In the picture, you can see the bacterial colony of the ball dress train in different magnificence. It remains to be clarified whether the contemporaries were really convinced that trains transmitted diseases or whether they used this as a death blow argument against them. Much has been said and written against train dresses, and fortunately, they no longer dominate fashion as they used to, as summarized in 1912 and went to say, in street dresses, the train is annoying and superfluous, whereas elegant ladies will probably not so readily accept it in gowns or the evening dress. Under the heading for poor order or for spa towns, the New Wiener Journal, as a Neue Wiener Journal, published a total of four drawings in 1930, all of which show both the train and the features of the blue skilled dress from the Homburg Museum. Illustrations from the magazines and newspapers refer to ideal, typical figures, postures, and ways of wearing. In general, evening and ball bones had long necklines tight waists, bare arms, and extravagantly cut skirts. They were meant to emphasize a woman's grace and femininity, but at the same time, not to tarnish her reputation. If one compares the blue skilled dress with the illustrations of drawings of the 1910s, it can be identified as a prototypical ball gown or evening dress. It would therefore have been suitable together with headdress, shoes, and stockings, for an aforementioned reunion, for example. Let me summarize. Whether in the morning at the drinking fountain, playing tennis on the sport field, or in the evening on the theater of the cure house, spa towns with their prototypical infrastructure or spa facilities and gardens, as well as event repertoires and daily programs offered all kinds of opportunities for encounters and interaction between guests seeking remuneration, but above all, pleasure. These socially coded occasions required appropriate dress and behavior that influenced and was influenced by spa culture. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much for this very interesting and very sort of um, documented in detail, actually, um, relationship between clothing and uh, the, the, the ritual life at the spas, um, particularly in its kind of spatial dimensions. That was very, very impressive. And um, I guess we can have um, or we can open the floor right away for questions and comments from the audience. I said, this is a question, I guess. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank very much for this for this great talk, Isabel. That was really, really uh, interesting. And a couple of questions that came up uh, immediately. Um, one really only an aside question it's quite clear that all of what you have done and i suppose what you do in your research refers to women's fashion um is man's men's fashion mentioned at all in these uh, manuals or these these guidebooks about uh, a spa fashion that you look at uh, at all so that, that that would be my first question and my second question would be um how much 
And, and I thought it was uh, particularly with uh, regard to the blue dress that you showed us, um, how much playing around uh, with conventions uh, did spa dresses uh, uh, allow uh, their uh, wearers? Yes, yeah, so you showed us this whole thing that fabric kind of, of the uh, kind of flesh color was used. So you, you, you pretend to be, if you like, to, to, to show more than you, than you actually show. That is one thing that's for the, for the evening dress, but how about, for instance, uh, tennis uh, skirts? Uh, is it the spa where tennis skirts become shorter? I mean, that would be an interesting uh, one as well. So I... Uh, more questions later, but I think these were... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got uh, three questions here, and I'm starting with the man dress. Um, for my dissertation, it is necessary um, to narrow down the topic in a meaningful way. And um, since the sources for women are better, I concentrated on them. Um, men's clothing would be a whole new research project and it was a, yeah, a practical decide. So there are magazines and uh, who address women and not the men's. Um, and although the um, objects in the museum, the men's clothes is very small. Uh, there are just only a few items in the museums that uh, can can give us some information yeah. for the yeah. man dress. Um, the second one was uh, um, the tennis skirts, who get shorter. I think um, I could say yes and no <laughs> in the spa um, towns because they have the um, the tournaments in the in the spas, and in this way the the um, popular players as um, Lenken or um, I don't know the, the other name who is always getting the uh, with the with Lenken um, they played with a with a skirt length they said okay they need clothes um, who uh, which which um, is is possible to move in yeah yeah so you have to um, yeah they they are can see that the skirts were shorter in the tournaments who were on the spa towns, but I cannot um, say mm. that it's the only um, mm. place where the where the yeah. tennis yeah. skirts yeah. get in. <clears throat> and you ask how much um, you have to to help me again with the with the question the. The woman can play with the with the clothing. Yeah, I mean, the the, the, the the tennis, the length of the tennis skirt comes into that, but also the evening dress. So when we do our spa research, uh, sort of one of our main um, uh, uh, theses is that the spa traditionally is a place uh, of social experiment, a place where uh, people can yeah, sort of play around with conventions. Um, not just clothing conventions, but any kind of conventions. Um, and so that was my question in how far uh, your research, the research into clothing, would either corroborate or reject this, this, uh, this thesis. Um, I'm sure that there are um, some, some um, playings with the, with the conventions, but I've not found it yet. Mm -hmm. um, women should be modest and reserved, and these um, supposedly feminine attributes should also be reflected in the clothing. And so um, they have the, the silk, um, the, the, the skin silk under the, the clothes who show <laughs> the man and the one who were attracted to them, um, the, the, the skin, but they, they don't show it really. So they are- yeah, Precisely, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I might come back to that later. So, yeah. I'm 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 looking looking at Thomas now, um, who's probably also interested in men's clothing. No, <laughs> Thomas, go ahead with your questions. Um, we can't hear you. You must um, something's wrong with your sound. We can't hear you. Um. Perhaps um, if there are other questions, we would um, jump in first with somebody else um, while Thomas is trying to get his uh, sound fixed. Um, I mean, sort of perhaps I jump in for myself um, because um, 
one of the things that obviously um, is also central to our pro project is the, the kind of European entanglements and exchanges, right? Sort of in how far do you think or did you sort of look at it? Is, is what is worn at the spas in international fashion at that time or are there sort of national peculiarities. I, I would not expect because I mean sort of the, the public in Bad Homburg is pretty international and probably they shop in the same 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 uh, shops, right? Um, yeah, you, you ask of the if my results can be transferred to the other spa towns, I'm right? No, it's more um, whether you have an idea whether the same kind of fashion tips and and uh, were, were um, made elsewhere as well, sort of internationally particularly. I mean, certainly uh, so was the same spa fashion in France or in England, or do you think that there were differences? If I can pop in here uh, quickly as a, as a, 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 a an addition, um, we saw um, posters of Harrogate of exactly the same time, the 1910s and 20s, kind of advertising Harrogate, and it's the it's the same kind of uh, women's fashion that is, they are not about fashion, but they show women uh, dressed in exactly the same way, it seems to me, as we saw in the uh, the images shown in Isabel's um, paper. So that would suggest that it's a, it's a European fashion rather than about Homburg one, yeah. Yeah, I would like um, to, to add something. Um, there is still a lack of the researching, so we have, can, cannot, uh, any, have any comparisons, but the people who um, visit the spa towns, um, if they were from France or from Russia or, or something like that, they all follow the same conventions. So yeah. I think that it's the same everywhere, <laughs> but maybe I'll found something special for Bad Homburg, for Wiesbaden, for Bad Nauheim, and then I can say it's kind, kind of the same, but it's something mm. special in there. I hope to find it. Thank you. Yeah, Thomas, I think I suggest that you perhaps uh, type in your questions into the chat so yes. that we can read. Ah, there you are. No. Ah, well, we can apparently hear you. The, wrong, the wrong microphone. I don't understand anything of this stuff. Uh, well, I had three questions. Uh, okay. The first about the age of the women who were the average age of the women visiting those spas. If you compare the uh, the women depicted in the journals with the advertisements, they seem rather young. If I look at that photograph you showed of this overall uh, in Bad Homburg, I think it was, uh, all these uh, people standing there in the late summer, they looked a bit more older. Perhaps you can tell something about that, about this difference. The second question, if I understood you very well, you had rather a very short period from 1910 till the end of the First World War. Is there a difference between the years before 1914 and the years 1914-18? Is there a change during the First World War? Is everybody just going to the spas, although uh, half, early, half of Europe is dying? Uh, what can you tell about that? And this, the last question would be, when does this start this difference of all those types of clothing for the morning, for the evening, for the afternoon, etc. Uh, is it halfway the 19th century? Is it later or already much before? Can you tell anything about that? That would be my three questions. Thank you, okay. Thomas. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the last first because I've in mind. Um, the start is very difficult, I think. Um, when you talk about fashion, you say fashion from France, and um, yeah. it was in the seventh century. So this is a starting point. So um, they're yeah, they decided to um, wear a dress in house after sleeping to get dressed, and then for the breakfast get dressed, and then when you meet somebody get dressed. And so um, this convention. Um, became regularly um, in in yeah in the everyday life should think so. Um, the other question was about the picture from Bad Homburg from the um, Elisabethenbrunn. Yeah. It's a postcard. It's a um, photograph. We have round about forty photograph pictures there, um, which is a yeah spe special thing <laughs> you can say um, because it's the 
the only one court spa town where you get these pictures from. Um, all of the people who get to the fountain in the morning come together and get a picture and you can could buy this one and uh, send it to people or get it to yourself. And um, in comparison, I show you the magazines. Yeah. Um, there was a the fountain dress, the Brunnenkleid. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there you have um, the models, the ideal, the young, fresh woman yeah. who like to show herself. And in comparison, you have to, to, um, to take these things to your own. So the older women say, okay, I'd like to be uh, fashionable. Yeah. But I cannot wear it's like this, so I get it for my own. So it's just like the ideal and the reality, the practice, normal everyday life practice. The reality was that there were much more elder women or younger women. It's something known about the age of the average age. That's what I meant. It is realistic, this picture of younger women in, 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 uh, in fountain dress. It is realistic. <laughs> Um, I would say it's an ideal and it's not so realistic yeah. when you compare the, the, the forms of the, of the um, bodies, yeah. you can see there are really, really uh, thin models and the yeah. normal woman in the age of the 1910s has a, um, I don't know the size, it's 42 in Germany, it was a normal size at that age and it's um, not size zero this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, um, you showed us also um, simply pictures from from other um, places at the spa, right? Think of the tennis court, right? And that's probably, I mean, so if you think of the sources, they are probably indeed where the people would rally that that take the kind of health aspect of the spa still fairly serious. And I think that's probably not so surprising that they are on average slightly older i would think i mean but um i i I'm, I'm thinking of of films made in the same period and but m's on the promenade and there you see a, a much more mixed picture right of there are also um obviously elderly people but there are also younger ones and uh this is more of a mix back there okay but there was um the question um if if you can say something about the the changes inflicted by the first world war yeah, um, there were a lot of changes in the First World War. Um, the most interesting is that the ball bones were gone. So mm -hmm. it was a um, stop and a regulation that it does not fit to the to the war. That the people have something like an evening event or a reunion. So they re regulated that they um, don't have to, to dance and have some parties like this. And so the um, the closing you have kept to to with you, um, so the ball gone is gone in this way. So um, and all the other things, um, the women were a little bit um, yeah. It's it's called simplicity. They have to say you have to stay simplicity because the war cannot handle the fashion as you got the consume before. Um, so you have to, the regulations from the um, Reichsbekleidungsstelle in Berlin, they said they, the, the uh, materials like the wool has to get to the, to the militaries. Yeah. And so the um, magazines say, um, the women have to wear a velvet or a summit like that. And the, the the materiality um, changes also changes in this way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thomas, question. let's 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 take the, the 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 questions around, right? So we can come back to you. I see that you haven't sort of put down your hand, <laughs> but um, let's perhaps give the floor also to Henrique, who has a couple of questions, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, for the next round of funding, which we will hopefully be able to uh, <laughs> do a show, we need to include a lump sum for dressing the team up. Yes, <laughs> I, think definitely. Can, I think you have provided us with all the good arguments to do to do so. 
So um, on a more serious note, um, uh, concerning uh, fashion and consumerism, we often came across the phenomenon that a transnational or European style of high fashion um, coincided with an interest in uh, regional fashion, uh, like like a sort of regional exoticism, like wearing a, a, a dirndl or something like that. So and how far did that play a role, this localism and transnational fashion as a first question? And the second one concerning um, shopping, I hopefully I, I didn't miss that in your in your presentation. If so, please um, uh, forgive me. So um, in, in how far um, was that Uh, um, uh, a matter attractive as a commercial activity for the local shoppers and how did they interact with the suppliers of fashion from from the big cities because that seems to be a, a constant issue that you go to a small town but you can buy some stuff from Paris or from London whatsoever so this this relationship between the transnational uh, the European and the and the local on both levels of fashion and uh, commerce Thank you. Um, yeah, I start with the second one because I'm uh, actually working on it. Um, I get the address books I'd like to show you here from Bad Homburg from the 1910th to the 1911. Um, I got the address book from Frankfurt on the Main, from uh, Wiesbaden, from Bad Nauheim and Bad Homburg and um, get around about 40 categories of consumerism. They included the shops, the fashion shops, the um, tailoring and, and workers who make this ones, and uh, the, yeah, the, the houses and uh, something like the, the um, galanterie van, um, <laughs> the, the accessoires, yeah, which you can say it's uh, accessoires from this. And so you, um, The idea is to put all these information in maps to see, like I show you here in Bad Homburg, um, that the, the shopping malls concentrate around about the district, maybe the Kurhaus or the interesting um, spa um, buildings like the Kochbrunnen or something like that. We have um, some streets in, in Frankfurt. You get there out of the... Um, Central Station to the Kaiserstraße. It's right the front of the um, of the main building, the Central Station, and this was the street with the, all the shops and all the spa towns. I'm uh, researching here um, have the idea that the people can do yeah day trips to Frankfurt because of, um, they are really good connected with the train. So you have to go shopping there. So I think it's um. um underlighted um, and an interesting um, thing, the, the shopping and the commercial activity. I think it's much more in this, um, but I'm researching it, but I am sure that I found um, the good argument that the shopping is one of the big things for the, from the fashionable bars. Um, can I quickly jump in here because um, our colleague Anna, who excuses herself due to her bad internet, link um, sent um, questions in the chat and one was the, 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 the same one that we already sort of um, discussed right the question whether there was a, a French or British um, style or an international style and you supplemented that with the question on the on the kind of localisms Henrique and the second question um, that uh, Anna asked is um, whether the doctors had just uh, opinions on um, the gowns uh, um, with the uh, causing dust or whether the doctors also discussed the influence um, of the clothing um, and the shape of the clothing on women's health more generally. Um, in the 1910 there are no, um, no I have to start again, um, in the in the 19th century there are something called Ärzteschriften, it's a doctor's guide like that um, who were writing about the dresses. Um, for example, at the fountain in the morning that you have to <coughs> get uh, to, to get warm and 
not too warm that you sweat. So um, you have to, to um, yeah, shape the clothing for health insurance. Um, I don't know, have I missed the other question in there? Um, the doctors, I, I don't know if there are any doctors who said the dust is really, um, yeah, it's diseases. The illness well, I was thinking, I was thinking when I heard that, I mean, I took note of this aspect as well. I mean, so if you, you relate or you sort of qualified it when you were saying sort of, um, are, are they really sort of worried about uh, the health or are they um, worried about morals, right? Sort of kind of thing. And um, you would um, indeed wonder whether they would be as concerned about germ and bacteria in the drink, drinking glasses that were washed and reused. But um, it echoes a broader discussion that we encounter with colleagues who do the architecture his, architectural history of mm -hmm. spas. And we see actually around the same time that what used to be um, a very lavish decor is criticized for it's uh, difficult to be kept clean, right? And you get tiled walls and these kind of things uh, advancing at roughly the same time in in this sector right so perhaps there is a broader discourse into which that fits uh, but one is really sort of doubting whether the sort of particular long gowns are the sort of central medical issue um, at the springs okay sort of thomas gets a bit nervous um, about his fourth question i think we'll uh, pass the floor to him again and then to astrid uh, yes, I first a very short question um, about the, the First World War. Uh, when was exactly already forbidden these uh, festivals, these balls, etc.? Already in August 1940, or even or only later? And my it was uh, my a bit longer question is uh, how international was the public in those spa towns? Wiesbaden, Bad Homburg, and Naumburg. Is Nauheim? Is there a difference between in this respect? And uh, what about the international public, if there was one, uh, about they buying clothes in Germany, dressing as a German? What about that? I mean, Germans dressing in a Paris mode, of course, is already for three centuries going on at the moment, but the reverse, did it happen? Is it something known? Or was it that horrible in the eyes of French or English guests that they always brought their clothes and hats and whatever from home? That would be a second question. Okay, um, the first one you said you asked about the when were the festivities forbidden. They stopped in August 1914 with the war, with the war starting, but they um, asked for um, stop the regulations in 1915. So they uh, stopped it. And so the, the spa towns like, um, yeah, it was, yeah, they, they get some money from, from these festivities. So they ask if there is a possibility to um, yeah to have some festivities and but they say no <laughs> and so okay. it's just mm -hmm. like the starting of the war and the others is um, you are with your question right about in the um, in the war discussion <laughs> when um, France is a um, fashion model in the 19th and in the 20th century also. And so uh, with the starting of the war, this model stops and they say Paris <laughs> is, a, is the enemy. And so we cannot follow Paris anymore. So we have to do our own. And so they uh, said the Parisian, the, the woman and the French woman was um, like a whore the with the clothing. So, and the German one, was um yeah respectable modest and reserved and they have contrasted these things and so um in the magazines always the parisian is the fashion model idea and but they are just a little bit um yeah they are just yeah i don't know how i can say it it's they are a, a little bit extravagant yeah. <laughs> and the german ones aren't and so there is uh there is the the idea of the dressing, the German ones and the Parisian. And so I think these stereotypes, which um, were discussed in the in the wartime, have been before, or have also been before in this bar town. So that uh, they all looked for the French women and something like that. 
Uh, but the question effect was reverse. This is also interesting for me, but the question is effect <laughs> reverse. How about French and English or whatever from whatever country guests in Wiesbaden or if there were any or in Bad Nauheim or Bad Homburg? Uh, Bad Homburg was the most international of these. It was most international. Did those yeah. French and English and perhaps Italian, Polish guests, whatever, did they buy also clothes in Germany, in Frankfurt or always took from from home? Is something known about that? Uh, okay. Um, Smith then. <laughs> I, I I'm thinking about the the guests lists. Yeah. Um, they are mostly Russian guests in Bad Homburg, for example. Uh -huh. Yeah. And the French aren't very much in the 20th century. Uh -huh. But you can buy French clothes there, in in Bad Homburg at the shops. But I have no sources that somebody wrote a letter and said I buy this dress here and I take it home or the other way around that they take their own clothes to the spa towns. Um, this is only the thing I can reconstruct when I have something like these, uh, the list, what you have to pack when you go to the spa town. So I'm um, pretty sure that the people get some dresses with them from France, from Russia, from, from wherever to the spa towns in Germany. <laughs> um, but I think you have to see there um, what's going on and what's around, what's fashionable, and then get something new in there. And to show how you are, that you have to be, that you have been there for several while. And yeah, it's, I, I, I have no sources about that, but I think it might have been. Don't use yeah. yourself. I, suppose I I would say team up with a literary scholar, because that would be obviously the follow up question. I mean, sort of, we know that sort of it wasn't unnoticed that the public was cosmopolitan in the 19th century, particularly, right? And you're looking at the last years of this period. And the question would be in, in, in the in the spa literature, I mean, what are the, the features that make people distinctive as nationals, right? Is it is it the behavior? Is it the language use? Or is it uh, indeed also clothing? What can you say, perhaps on the on the basis of the spa literature about this? Obviously, not a no-brainer, right? Sort of a <laughs> difficult question. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, I. Not sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, but this is this is something to perhaps for us, for us as well still to look into. Right, sort of what are actually the markers that are used um, to, for these distinctions? I guess language is important, but it, it might not just be language. It would be interesting to, to follow that up. But I didn't want to prevent you to ask another question, Astrid. It's your, your turn again. Uh, uh, just to talk about him here, if you remember uh, in, in one of our podcasts, we uh, quoted uh, uh, Turgenev Smoke, and there we have this very nice uh, description again of. Uh, Russian women, and this is done indeed by voice, by language, and by clothes, in particular by color, color of the dress. Yeah, okay. so I mean, it, it is uh, certainly uh, used. Um, I wanted to come back to one uh, of uh, Thomas's questions and then um, kind of <clears throat> turn this into my own. Um, you you asked earlier, Thomas, when did it all start that uh, that uh, women you know, sort of wore three or four different dresses per day? Yes, and then Isabel told us yes that the, the kind of in everyday life the fashion as such uh, demanded it very early on. What we do know is that certainly in the 18th century that was the done thing in spas as well. We have. Um, uh, uh, texts from uh, say the late 18th century the 1770s where uh, a spa doctor um, this time in Pyrmont uh, praises the dresses the dresses the women wear in the morning because they are not quite as uh, kind of suffocating and limiting they're much better for the body than the dresses they then wear in kind of later during the day let alone in the evening yeah so so the, the, this kind of constant changing of uh, a dress of dress coat uh, seems to be kind of written into the fabric of spa life uh, uh, certainly since the since the 18th uh, century um, but I wonder uh, Isabel um, 
in the time that you research into are there signs that this is actually changing? I mean, okay, we have the First World War when there are no balls going on. So we have one time fewer the day that I need to, to, to redress. But I would also wonder about, yeah, kind of um, the rhythm of the day uh, uh, and, and, and habit, uh, whether, yeah, it's becoming in the, in the early, early 20th century, it's becoming more normal to wear one or perhaps two uh, different dresses uh, per day rather than uh, three or four, God knows how many. And one a tiny question on the side, um, <laughs> given that, the, you know, that, that you come with so and so many um, uh, sets of clothes and then you buy some there. So how many suitcases did people have when they came and how many when they went? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I have no answer for that question. It would be really great if, to know that, but I have any source about that. Mm -hmm. So I have to pass. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a question back to you. <laughs> can I can I have the the hand on? <laughs> um, you told me that in the journal of the Luxus and the Moden um, there are many um, ideas of of the the yeah the clothing. Um, you meant the uniform from Zwierlein or which which uh, thing you you mean when you wrote me that in the email no um so the journal des luxus unter moden the journal of luxury and fashion was a german journal published in weimar from the 1780s or 90s onwards uh, and uh, when the spa uh, season approached they would always have uh, reports and uh, stories and uh, suggestions and all sorts of things about spas in their issues uh, and one of the things that you find are kind of colored plates with uh, dresses so suggested dress codes for women for this particular year it's not for particular spas it's for particular years yes yeah? so fashion this year demands that your hat be five meters high yeah that sort of thing mm. okay yeah um, Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Henrike has a question left, I guess, and Thomas is now actively using the chat. Thank you. It's, it's, it's anecdotal evidence from, from literature, just a short follow up, because I remember, of course, in the Russian literature, it's, it's fashion everywhere, and it's used, of course, in order to characterize the, the status of the of the people so it's it's in Turgenev it's in Dostoevsky but it is as well which maybe is more interesting for example as well in our podcast so we advertise our podcast once again there's a citation from the Swedish author um, Anneli Jordal um, and it's a recent novel from the 2000s about a Swedish spa at the turn of the century and there it's the Russian ladies being too lavishly dressed so this idea of um, a too glamorous appearance which somehow uh, discredits the, 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 the women and the simplicity of style as being something Western or more decent is is uh, currently expressed in uh, in literature and evidently if we take a look at Jordal it is something which even travels through a hundred of years as a as a stereotype. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I um, think also in the English in in Victorian novels you find and again it's kind of stereotyping uh, the uh, the Russian spa guests as kind of loud. In a yes, in a, in a number of respects, both uh, as far as their voices, but also as far as the the cut and the colours of their uh, dresses are concerned. Mm. Okay, yeah, but it's, it's it seems to be very interesting um, to think about sort of. Um, I mean, what I liked about your approach, uh, Isabel, is that you're you're really focusing on. On, uh, on a really micro kind of approach, right? You, you go into almost into the shops, right? Sort of into the, the changing rooms um, in, in the buildings there. So you can really sort of um, narrow it down very, very easily. Um, if you look at the advertisement of accommodation at the time, perhaps um, 
the the, the question of of space for clothing or also the the kind of support that they offer for trans uh, transportation obviously right so sort of we we know that you have a lot of things to bring back right that type of thing uh, would be interesting if there 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 would be more to find also perhaps some echoes of that in the, in in the, in the in the guidebooks of the period right so yeah sort of i mean up to the idea and that's um what thomas just wrote into the chat right sort of would then the bad homburg dress be a souvenir that you take home and where you, i mean so i mean thinking about the normal functions of, of social distinction that that vacationing has right sort of it would be quite important if you go back to st petersburg or to wherever right sort of that you sort of have a proof of you being having been part of the the big circus in in one of the spas right yeah i'd like to add something for that um there is in the municipal um archive in in bad homburg there are two pictures of dresses from 91 and 92 and there's um the the down line here is a um, homburg season it's an english newspaper but they have no provenance where it's from so i think that's an English newspaper or it's an English fashion magazine who um, published these dresses. And so you get the, the idea I have with the, with the pictures. The people get to Hamburg to wear these things, to buy something and to bring it home. So, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, at the time, Hamburg was the place where the um, uh, British king was going to, like Edward, right? Um, so. Um, that is perhaps not so surprising that it's a Homburg is becoming a bit a past pro toto, right? Sort of like spa before was the spa um, for for sort of the contemporary British uh, kind of uh, audience. It, it, it must have been Homburg to some degree. Um, but there are two other questions or, or things to think about that Thomas put in the chat. Let me see. I mean, food is an interesting story as well, but certainly not your topic here. But um, um, here we know, of course, that um, there is, again, a certain chronology. And the interesting thing is that up far into the 19th century, right, what characterized uh, the spas as a place of social exchange was that everyone was seated at the same table, right, that there was a table d'hôte um and and th this is where a lot of social mixing happened and there was very little choice in terms of food and it is i think it's the french in baden baden who bring over the kind of french restaurant type thing and then we get this more s specified kind of things yeah. but then already as a kind of an attraction that it's not just the local food but it's international and um yeah the question about language is also a very interesting one and ac actually needs probably to be looked at also in comparison even within germany let's say from spa to spa right sort of in ems after 1870 nobody spoke french anymore and no frenchman wanted to go there anymore um but um i guess in baden baden that was slightly different right sort of where the french influence and the french exchange was 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 much bigger and i guess yeah, Homburg was, um, Ems was also, um, after the pulling out uh, of the French, was very Russian dominated, right? Whereas uh, I think sort of Homburg was a much more international place at, at the period. I remember that there were also some of the Oriental kind of rulers coming and creating a lot of trouble because they didn't know what to serve them and sort of so on and so forth, right? Sort of, but this is certainly also a very interesting topic to explore. Uh, further in much more detail. Shall we give the last question to our colleague Astrid? I'm so sorry for being so uh, persistent. I just had a, a, an, an idea which I, I quickly wanted to share because the time in which or kind of um, which you research is also the time, of course, of the rise of Lebensreform concepts and Lebensreform sanatoria. And there we have uh, quite extensive prescriptions of clothes and it's for women it's about being comfortable and about not showing the body it's not about a kind of body shape um, all of this yes all of kind of the, the, the fashion criteria go out and it's about uh, uh, comfortability uh, and I wonder whether some of these manuals uh, uh, at least are written uh, precisely against the prescriptions that you get for what to wear in the fashionable spa. Yeah, so the fashionable spa uh, or, or the, 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 the uh, sanatorium, the Lebensreform sanatorium, 
uh, quite specifically uh, versus the fashionable spa in, put in, in uh, terms of uh, women's fashion. I think that would be an interesting point to, to, to look at, an interesting sideline. Uh, so that was it, sorry. <laughs> So that was more of a comment than a question, yeah, which, sure. which means that slowly but surely we can sort of um, let our speaker from the hook, so to speak, and uh, thank her for her very interesting, very nicely, um, also visually kind of prepared presentation on this fascinating subject of fashion as far as we have seen. It's very, very broad. It's a, it's, it's, it's a world in itself, obviously. And perhaps the kind of uh, taking a small kind of local and also in terms of chronology, small kind of sector into closer inspection seems to be obviously a very wise thing to do. So good luck with the, the project. And we are all looking forward to the final product of the dissertation, the book, uh, which we also will hope will be as lavishly um, illustrated as your talk was. Many, many thanks for sharing your research with us. Um, remains to announce that we have a few more um, seminars in the pipeline, um, but probably we will resume our series in the new year only, and we'll keep you posted about the program. Thanks very much for coming today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again for this very, very interesting talk. Thank you. And that's probably the moment where I should try to stop my recording, for which I again have to uh, 